Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Alaa Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. The title of my lecture today is Fetal Gross Restriction. So, what we wanna to discuss today? The definitions of fetal gross restriction and small for gestational age, epidemiology, and risk factors of fetal gross restriction, its classifications, then the old one and the new one, etiology, diagnosis, treatment, and complications, and lastly, some key points and prognosis. Let's start our journey. First, please remember these two sentences. Different populations have different gross standards. And each fetus has its own individual gross curve. So, what about the fetal gross restriction? Simply, the fetus is smaller than it should be because it is not growing at a normal rate inside the uterus. In the past, it is called IGR, intrauterine gross restriction. And now in the new literature, you will find the expression of fetal gross restriction is of common use nowadays. Okay? So, we need a scientific definition. Small for gestational age can be defined if less than 10th percentile weight for gestational age on a single tone gross curve. Please look to the picture on the right side here. This is the 10th percentile. This is the 90th, 90th percentile. And in between the average expected weight. Okay. Below the 10th percentile is called the small for gestational age. Above the 90th percentile is called large for gestational age. So we are talking here about lower than 10th percentile. This is the small for gestational age. But small for gestational age could be healthy, but constitutionally small fetus. In most of cases, in 70% of cases, this the, the baby is small, but, but the baby is healthy. Constitutional factors like what? Like the gender, female gender, is smaller than male. Uh, parents' ethnicity also is a factor. So there may be constitutionally small fetus, okay? And this constitutes the majority. While the pathology is in the true fetal gross restriction, because it has a greater risk of perinatal morbidity and mortality and long-term health defect. What about the definition by the World Health Organization and the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists? What is the difference between both of them? In WHO, they said, they estimated that the less than third percentile, less than third percentile is called fetal gross restriction. While in American College, they said less than tenth percentile. So in this area, Below the 10th percentile, this is the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist, but less than 3rd percentile by the WHO definition. Okay? Both of them is present either below the 3rd percentile, as WHO said, or below 10th percentile, as American College said. Okay? Also, we can consider the baby fetal gross restricted if the abdominal circumference is less than 10th percentile for gestational age. As you see here, this is the gestational age in the, in the picture, and this is the abdominal circumference. If the baby, during the measurement, we found the abdominal circumference less than 10th percentile here in this area, Okay, we consider it fetal gross restricted. Okay, so the abdominal circumference can use can be used also in the definition of 
increase the growth restriction. What about the epidemiology? The incidence about 5 to 10 percent of pregnancies of fetal growth restriction. It is the second leading cause of perinatal mortality. That's why it is very important and is responsible for 30 percent of stillborn infants. Also, we should know that it is the most common cause of premature birth and intrapartum asphyxia. So, what about the risk factor for small for gestational age? Maternal disease like antiphospholipid syndrome, like renal disease, like chronic hypertension, like vascular disease, like diabetes, especially if affecting the blood vessel diabetes complicated by vascular disease because all of us know diabetes is associated with macrosomic baby more commonly but if associated with vascular disease can lead to small for gestational age or fetal growth restricted baby also if the lady has a, a previous history of a small for gestational age or her maternal age above 40 or she is doing a vigorous daily exercise or using cocaine in pregnancy or smoking more than 11 cigarettes per day during the pregnancy. Also, pregnancy associated plasma protein A, if it is less than 0.4 multiple of median, this is a risk factor for fetal growth restriction. Okay. Also, maternal or paternal history of being small for gestational age baby. If the mother or the father himself, if any one of them was small for gestational age. Okay. Other risk factors including IVF pregnancy and the F pregnancy interval occur okay, in less than six months. Those who are taking medications like beta blocker, antihypertensive drugs, also non liberty could be a cause, a risk factor for small for gestational age. So let us know the normal fetal growth. We can divide the normal fetal growth into three stages. Look to this picture, please. The first stage till 16 weeks. The second stage between 16 to 32. The third stage between 32 and 40. Okay? During the first 16 weeks, this is called the primary phase of cellular hyperplasia. There is rapid increase in cell number in this stage from 0 to 16 weeks. There is cellular hyperplasia. What about the stage between 16 and 32? There is both cellular hyperplasia and cellular hypertrophy. I mean, there is increase in the number of cells and also the size of the cells. The third stage between 32 to 40 weeks is cellular hypertrophy phase. There is increase in cell size and during this phase, the most fetal fat and the glycogen are accumulated. So, these three phases or stages of development of the baby inside the uterus. Okay? Of course, any cause or risk factor affecting the cellular hyperplasia will have more hazardous effect than late after 32 when there is only cellular hypertrophy phase. So you should know the normal fetal growth very well to understand how fetal growth restriction happen and different types of fetal growth restriction. The classification of a small for registrational age, the baby may be healthy, but constitutionally small due to the male gender, due to synesthesia, Okay, or through fetal gross restriction, which may be symmetric or asymmetric one. 
In symmetric one, the whole body proportionally is decreased. But in asymmetric one, the head is spurred, while the, the body, the abdomen, is decreased in size. Okay? Okay. We can classify morphologically, and this is one of the old classification, into symmetric and asymmetric one. Like in this picture, symmetric IGR or fetal gross restriction and the asymmetric fetal gross restriction. According to what? According to the ratio between head circumference to abdominal circumference. Okay? Type 1, which constitute 20%, is the symmetrical one. The whole body is decreased symmetrically. So the baby is symmetrically small have normal head to abdomen ratio and this type 1 or symmetric 1 constitute 20 percent but type 2 which constitute 80 percent the abdominal circumference is smaller than the head circumference that's why we call it asymmetric one type 3 fetal gross restriction start as a symmetric one but become asymmetric, so combined type 1 and type 2 is present in type 3. Let us see in this table the difference between both of them. This is the symmetric one, and this is the asymmetric one. This is going to skew 20%, and this is 80%. Symmetric one, early onset gross restriction. While the asymmetric one, late onset gross restriction. So to start late. In pregnancy, while the symmetric one starts early. You remember when we said the normal gross of the baby inside the uterus and the stages, and we divide them into three stages from 0 to 16, from 16 to 32, and from 32 up to 40. Usually, the symmetric affects the baby in, in cellular hyperplasia phase. Okay? A while asymmetric one usually affecting in the cellular hypertrophies, okay, or in the in the stage of cellular hyperplasia and hypertrophy phase, the middle one. Okay, again, in symmetric one, uniform gross restriction, but in asymmetric there is head spurring. In symmetric one, long term gross failure. But in asymmetric one, potentially reversible. In symmetric one, associated with decreased cell number, mainly. But in asymmetric one, associated with decreased cell size. In symmetric IGR, associated with less catch up gross in the first year of life after delivery, less catch up gross in the first year of life. While in asymmetric one, infant demonstrate more catch-up gross than, than symmetric IGR in the first year of life. And this picture show you the symmetric on the left and the asymmetric on the right. And you can see the difference in the size of the head in pose. Here there is a sparing of the head on the right side. While the body is small, the abdominal circumference is small. While the, on the other side, in the symmetric, the whole body and the head, all of them is proportionally small. This is the classification and one of the oldest classification of Campbell. Also, we can have another classification called the etiological classification. We divide them into four categories, intrinsic, extrinsic, combined, and the idiopathic. This is also an old classification. Intrinsic means what? Intrinsic means fetal condition like chromosomal abnormality or intrauterine infection is the cause of this gross restriction. Okay? Extrinsic means what? Means there is something outside the fetus. I mean, there may be maternal disease or placental pathology is the cause of fetal gross restriction. Combine if both intrinsic and extrinsic is present and the idiopathic if the cause of fetal gross failure is unknown. 
This is another old classification according to the etiology. Let us go to the most recent classification, which is early and late onset fetal growth restriction. It is suggested that we can divide the fetal growth restriction into two categories before 32 weeks gestational age and after 32 gestational age. Okay? The early one is associated with more complication and associated with preeclampsia commonly and abnormal umbilical artery doppler finding and the poor perinatal outcome. A wide delayed fetal growth restriction is associated with milder, milder degree of placental dysfunction and less likely to be associated with preeclampsia and the changes in the umbilical artery doppler. This is the comparison between both of them, early onset and the late onset fetal growth restriction. What is the challenge? The challenge in the early onset is in the management, okay? Because it, is, it occurs late, a while Sorry, it occurs early. A while in late onset, the challenge in the detection. So, the challenge in the early onset, fetal growth restriction in the management, because it started early. A while the challenge in the late onset, in the detection of fetal growth restriction. What is the prevalence? Fortunately, the prevalence of late onset is 70% while the early onset, which is more dangerous, is 30%. Okay? As we said before, gestational age, here before 32 weeks, an early one, here above 32 weeks. In ultrasound finding, the fetus in early onset may be very small, but in late onset, fetus not necessarily very small. Yes, it is small, but not necessarily very small. Doppler velocimetry, there is abnormalities in the umbilical Doppler, middle cerebral artery and ductus venosus. A while in late onset, cerebral blood flow, the redistribution is the main positive item that could be seen by the Doppler. Less commonly to see umbilical artery doubler changes. While in early onset, you will find many changes in the doubler, in the umbilical artery and the ductus venosus and middle cerebral artery also. What about the biophysical profile? Impulse may be abnormal. Hypertensive disorder with pregnancy, more frequent in early onset than late onset. What about the placental histopathology? Poor placental implantation, spiral artery abnormalities, maternal vascular male perfusion, all of them in early onset fetal growth restriction. A while in late onset, it is, there is less specific placental finding, mainly there is altered diffusion. What about the perinatal mortality? Perinatal mortality is expected to be high in the early onset, while it is low in late onset, fetal growth restriction. What about the maternal cardiovascular hemodynamic status? Low cardiac output, high peripheral vascular resistance in early onset, fetal growth restriction, while in late onset, fetal growth restriction, there is less marked maternal cardiovascular finding. Delphi procedure 2016 diagnosed the early and the late onset fetal growth restriction using the ultrasound and Doppler and fetal biometric measurements. And we compare here between the early onset and the late onset according to Delphi procedure. Early onset diagnosed if abdominal circumference or expected fetal weight is less than 3 percentile or umbilical artery 
was absent in the diastolic flow. Or abdominal circumference or expected fetal weight less than 10 percentile and uterine artery pulsatility, pulsatility index less, uh, more than 95 percentile and or umbilical artery pulsatility index more than 95 percentile. A while late onset, abdominal circumference or expected fetal weight less than 3 percentile or 2 of 3 of the following criteria present. 2 of 3 of the following criteria present. Abdominal circumference or expected fetal weight less than 10 percentile. Abdominal circumference or expected fetal weight drop more than 2 quartile. More than 2 quartile. On the gross chart. Number 3. Cerebral placental ratio less than 5 percentile or umbilical artery pulsatility index more than 95 percentile. What about the cerebral placental index and what does it mean? The middle cerebral artery pulsatility index over umbilical artery pulsatility index if more than one this is the norm. When this ratio drop below one, the risk of, of adverse neonatal outcome increase by 10 folds. So if less than one, the risk of neonatal outcome complication is 10 fold. What about the Doppler flow? or a Doppler for follow-up of umbilical artery. It has a major importance in early onset fetal growth restriction. In cases of late onset fetal growth restriction, umbilical artery Doppler can be normal or only become abnormal in advanced stages of the disease. Okay, look to this picture please to understand the umbilical cord Doppler. Above this line, this is the arterial umbilical artery, so tooth appearance, so tooth appearance, as you see here. This is the peak systolic, and this is the end diastolic. This is the peak systolic, and this is the end diastolic. This is normal. In this picture, this is normal umbilical doubling. Okay? Below this line is the venous blood the umbilical vein. So this is umbilical artery, so to its appearance, with systole and end diastole. And below this line is the umbilical vein flow. Okay? As you see here, this is normal. Sometimes there is abnormalities can be detected, as we will see examples in this picture. Okay? So what are the etiologies for fetal growth restriction? We can divide them into three main groups. Maternal, fetal, uteroplacental factor. What about the maternal? Any maternal disease like chronic hypertension, preeclampsia, diabetes with vascular disease, renal disease, autoimmune disease like antiphospholipid syndrome, Hereditary or acquired thrombophilia, severe anemia, stress, and depression, all maternal disease like this can cause fetal growth restriction. Maternal habits like smoking, like alcohol intake, like heroin or cocaine or morphine intake, maternal malnutrition, chronic malnutrition, especially if before pregnancy and if it continues during the pregnancy also, this malnutrition. Maternal medications like anti seizure medication, like anticoagulant, anti warfarin, anticoagulant, anti neoplastic agents, beta blocker, and folic acid antagonists. 
that's why Peter Plucker, if you remember, with hypertension with pregnancy, we give alpha methyl dopa, we prefer it over the beta blocker because usually beta blocker may be associated with fetal gloss restriction or small for gestational age baby. Okay, so some medication may cause fetal gloss restriction, as we mentioned, maternal residence in high acute and exposure to ionizing radiation also considered maternal causes. What about fetal causes? Chromosomal abnormalities like trisomy 21, 18, or 30, and this contributes 5 to 20 percent of fetal growth restricted cases. Genetic syndromes like gene responsible for insulin like growth factor production, genetic mutations has a rule in fetal growth restriction. Multifetal gestation, especially in monochorionic twin and twin to twin transfusion syndrome, also due to abnormal placentation and any other anomalies. Fetal infection constitutes 5 to 10 percent of fetal growth restriction, like cytomegalovirus, rubella, varicella zoster, and toxoplasma infection. Lastly, inborn error, error of metabolism, but it is a rare cause. This is the fetal, so we covered now the maternal and the fetal. The third one is the placental factor. placental factors like placental insufficiency, if there is reduced placental perfusion, abnormalities in placenta, whatever implantation and the attachment, implantation like low-lying placenta as in placenta previa or implantation of the placenta at the lateral side of the uterus or in its attachment to the wall of the uterus and premature separation of part of the placenta as in approximate placenta. Other placental causes like chorioangioma, chorionic bilitis by loop the placenta, abnormalities in the insertion of the cord like filaments insertion of the cord or torsion of the cord or the presence of a single umbilical artery. So this is the three groups, maternal, fetal, and placental causes. What about the diagnosis? Clinical and investigations, medical and obstetric history. History, first, you should be sure of the last menstrual period to calculate the gestational age and to be sure that the date is sure and confirmed by ultrasound because one of the causes of or differential diagnosis for small for gestational age is the miscalculation of the date, the expected date. You should ask about any medical disorders, any maternal diseases, any obstetric history of period delivery of grossly restricted fetus? What about the weight gain during follow-up in antenatal care? Decreased maternal weight gain during the pregnancy is a relatively insensitive sign of inadequate fetal growth. Also, it cannot differentiate between true fetal growth restriction and small but healthy baby. What is very important and you should remember is the synthesis fundal height. This is the most common method used clinically to estimate fetal growth. However, it doesn't differentiate between fetal growth restricted baby the true one and the small but healthy baby, okay? Because symphysis fundal height will tell you this is a small for gestational age. Is it true fetal growth restriction or it is constitutionally small baby? We cannot swear about that from symphysis fundal height. 
how can we measure it as you see in the picture from the symphysis pubis here to the top of the fundus of the uterus using a tab measure okay and weeks is considered each one centimeter is considered one week and it is more sensitive if it is measured after 24 weeks we can say there is fetal growth restriction from symphysis fundal height if you found the difference of three centimeter or more from the expected gestational age or the calculated gestational age if there is some three centimeter or more we uh, uh, during the measurement below the estimated gestational age so we consider it small for gestational age Okay, and we consider each one centimeter by one week. We can do karyotyping in severely fetal gross restricted fetus with a structural anomaly, especially those detected before 23 weeks of gestation, especially if you try an artery doubler is norm. Also, we can do serological screening for congenital cytomegalovirus and toxoplasma infection in severely small or gestational age fetus. Also, we should refer for detailed fetal anatomical survey and uterine artery, umbilical artery, and the middle cerebral artery, Doppler by fetal medicine specialist. If severe, small for gestational age is identified at 18 to 20 week scale. This is very important and this is important rule for fetal med maternal medicine specialist. So, to continue the diagnosis, Look to this table, ultrasound examination and doubler velocimetry. What is the rule of each? In the ultrasound fetal biometry, like biobarometer diameter, abdominal circumference, which is very important and very sensitive parameter in detecting fetal growth restriction. And if I ask you which is the more sensitive parameter for detection of fetal growth restriction, please don't forget to say the abdominal circumference. Also, the estimated gestational age, estimated fetal weight is important. Head to abdomen ratio, femur to abdomen ratio, amniotic fluid index, character of the placenta in details, the site of the implantation, the grade of the placenta, any complications, any separation, any pathology, fetal morphology assessment, any congenital anomalies also, and also echocardiography. What about the Doppler? The Doppler you can divide into three main categories. Uterine arteries for maternal circulation, umbilical artery for fetal placental circulation, other fetal vessels like cerebral artery is important, abdominal aorta, renal artery, ductus venosus, and transverse sinus. This is an example for the ultrasound measurement. This is the head, this is the piperital diameter, and this is the occipital frontal diameter, and this is the head circumference. On the right side here is the abdominal circumference, and the, we should take a proper view to measure the abdominal circumference very well. And the view should include the hip, the sorry, the rib here, the stomach the portal sinus and umbilical vein. Portal sinus and umbilical vein, stomach and the rib. This is the, the proper view to measure the abdominal circumference and we said this is the most sensitive parameter for fetal gross restriction. Here we are measuring the femoral lens, as you see, and here we are measuring the amniotic fluid pocket which is normally more than 
2 cm in a single pocket. Some example for Doppler velocimetry, this is the umbilical artery, Doppler, this is a stole, big stole, and this is the diastole, in the diastole, okay, and this is normal, and this is for middle cerebral artery, okay, this is normal also, and this is for ductus venosus, as you see here. This is also for ductus venosus. This is normal. Both of them are normal. Systole and diastole. This is the ventricular systole. And this is the diastole and the atrial contraction. Okay. So on the right side, all of these are normal. This is an example of umbilical artery, middle cerebral artery, and ductus venosus. And you will see some abnormalities in other pictures, and in the left side. This is a picture of normal umbilical artery, as we mentioned before. For the artery, above this line, this is for the artery. Below this line is the floor of the vein. The artery, there is big systolic and the end diastolic here. Okay. This is the big systolic and this is the end diastolic one. Okay. This is normal. This is how it looks. The, the doubler wave four in a um, normal umbilical artery. Let us see some abnormalities in the umbilical artery, Doppler. Look to the left side here. You can see here the endodiastolic flow. So we call it absent endodiastolic flow. There is absent endodiastolic flow. Okay, this is abnormal. Here on the right side, there is reversed diastolic flow. Reversed. As you see down here, down the line here, the diastole supposed to be here is reversed. And this is dangerous sign. Reverse it, diastolic flow. So in the left picture, absent in the diastolic flow, there is absent in the diastolic flow, but on the right side here, reverse it, diastolic flow. This is more dangerous. Okay. Both of them abnormal. Not with systolic flu. One of the abnormalities also in the umbilical artery doubler is notched. As you see, this is this is the notch, this is the notch, this is the notch, notched systolic flu. The Doppler enabled the non-invasive detection of the signs of placental insufficiency and fetal hemodynamic changes. Because sometimes the baby adapt with less blood supply by some changes by directing the blood toward the brain, toward the adrenal glands, toward the heart. Okay? When umbilical artery doubler flow in these are normal, it is reasonable to repeat surveillance every 14 days. Using doubler, it is possible to identify restricted fetus at risk of hypoxia, which corresponds to approximately 40% of cases. And this is a big percentage. The importance of doubler also, it enables differential diagnosis between fetuses that are deficient in nutrient or having hypoxia and require intensive management and other fetuses that are constitutionally small but healthy where we can do more conservative treatment with 
with healthy fetus okay its use significantly reduces perinatal mortality as well as iatrogenic prematurity and its complication i mean if you diagnose as the case as a small for gestational age and you consider this baby fetal, fetal gross restraint okay the Doppler is normal. So this is may suggesting that this baby and the other parameters were normal rather than the baby is a small. Okay. So if you found something that, like that, you, you will have conservative management. You will do follow up because you are not in need to deliver the baby prematurely. And so the baby will not exposed to the risk of delivery of premature baby at its complication okay so this is very important fetal growth velocity there are several methods to evaluate fetal growth velocity including longitudinal growth shorts reduced growth velocity is normal normally taken to be a fall between consecutive ultrasound scan of more than 50 percentiles for abdominal circumference or more commonly expected fetal weight okay biophysical profile scoring other method to do follow up for small for gestational age to do biophysical profile scoring this score contain five items each items have two so total of 10 what are the item of biophysical profile non-stress test if the baby is reactive will have two in uh, two score fetal breathing movement at least one episode and continue for more than 30 seconds taking the score two Gross body movement, two discrete body or lamp movement. This movement, three or more, will have the score two. Fetal muscle tone, what does it mean? Extension and deflection of a lamp. One or more will take two in score. Amniotic fluid, pocket at least one pocket more than two centimeter in two perpendicular plane will take two okay so you can cal calculate at the end the the score of this baby and remember that the biophysical profile score can predict both fetal ph and outcome and the score of less than or equal to four is associated with fetal ph equal to or less than 7.2 a wild score of less than 2 has a sensitivity of 100 percent for acidemia so biophysical profile scoring can give you a good information about how healthy is this baby let us go to the ctg the cardiotography reactive ctg virtually exclude fetal hypoxia fetal heart rate stv short term variation is a biophysical parameter obtained by ctg the computerized one that reflect autonomic nervous system function in the context of fetal gross extraction and the accompanying presence of severe hypoxemia or hypoxia the fetal sympathetic and the parasympathetic activity is altered resulting in what reduced the fetal heart rate variation and thus reduced stv short-term variation okay back to this picture this is the picture of igr and this is another picture of the control this is a picture of IOGR and this is a picture of IOGR also. Short term variation 
reduced. Assessing fetal growth, how to assess the fetal growth? By abdominal palpation is not sensitive, just abdominal grafts and the abdominal palpation and the abdominal girth is not sensitive enough to say small for gestational age. But what is more sensitive and better is to do synthesis fundal height. As we mentioned before, and the referred woman after 24 weeks gestation for serial assessment of fetal size using ultrasound, if you found a difference of three centimeter or more in symphysis fundal height, less than expected, because here there is a possibility of fetal growth restriction. Also. If measurement of fundal height is inaccurate, why it is inaccurate? Because obesity by the mass index more than 35, the, the, the patient has a large fibroidous pregnancy, she has a polyhydramnus, so symphysis fundal height here is inaccurate. So I need another tool to confirm the presence of fetal growth restriction like ultrasound. Okay? Can we do screening for fetal gross restriction high risk cases? Yes, biochemical, clinical, ultrasound, and by special test. Biochemical, by measuring the alpha fetal protein. If increased in absence of fetal anomaly, the risk of fetal gross restriction later in pregnancy is increased from five to 10 fold. Imagine, so if you found the alpha fetal protein increased in absence of fetal anomaly, the risk of occurrence of fetal growth restriction later in pregnancy increased five to ten fold. Clinically, by daily fetal movement count by the patient, you ask her to count the movement by palpation, and we said it palpation itself, just abdominal palpation is not sensitive. But what is sensitive is the symphysis fundal height. And we consider each centimeter as a one week. And we compare the symphysis of fundal height with the expected or the estimated gestational age. Ultrasound for fetal grass, head circumference, abdominal circumference, and we said abdominal circumference is the, is the most accurate one. And the expected fetal weight also. And if less than 10 centile on customized charts or reduced the gross to velocity indicate fetal gross restriction, special tests like non-stress test, amniotic fluid index, by physical profile, and doubler of the umbilical artery, if needed. How to protect and prevent? Could it could fetal gross restriction prevent it? The answer is up till now no, but we can take some protective measures like regular and the early prenatal care and the healthy diet and the steady weight gain help to try to prevent fetal gross restriction. Avoid smoking, alcohol, and the other risk factors. High green leafy vegetable intake pre-pregnancy has been reported to be protective. Ludus aspirin for women at risk of preeclampsia is likely to reduce the intrauterine gross restriction by about 10%. Use of low molecular weight heparin for the prevention of fetal gross restriction should remain in the research setting until it is proved by many studies later on. Multi-center study later on, and we know that the methods for prevention and the treatment is changing with research trials. Okay, what about the management? First, identify the patient at rest by taking medical and obstetric history, measuring the the uterine growth by synthesis 
surface of under height, identification of small features by ultrasound, by the abdominal circumference, by parietal head circumference, expected fetal weight, identification of malnourished fetus by head to abdominal ratio, femur to abdominal ratio, umbilical doubler, by physical profile is used to assess the fetal function. Ask the patient for adequate bed rest in left lateral position to increase the blood supply to the baby and to the heart of the mother. Smoking cessation and avoid other risk factors like medications, which is risky, and treat any underlying correctable cause. Give low dose aspirin, maternal supplementation, maternal oxygen therapy and use of silvinafil drug. However, there is no evidence of benefits in the natural course of the disease with the use of this regimen. So, researches are running about all of this. Antenatal steroid should be given to any gross restricted fetus when delivery is expected before 34 weeks. So, we should give antenatal steroids like betamisazone or dexamisazone 12 milligram 24 hour apart two doses. Okay? There is good evidence for the efficacy of magnesium sulfate for fetal neuroprotection case of return delivery between 26 to 32 weeks gestation age recently melatonin creatine and n style cysteine have potential as a novel neuroprotective and the cardioprotective agent in fetal gross restriction and this is also under research the decision for time and the mode of delivery needs to be individualized because the management of such case of fetal gross restriction is a real challenge. Yes. As there is no effective treatment to reverse fetal gross restriction, prenatal management is aimed primarily in determining the ideal timing and the mode of delivery. And this is actually the treatment. The ideal timing and the mode of delivery, this is the most important items in the treatment of fetal gross restriction. Delivery should be in a tertiary center with multidisciplinary team and the availability of well-equipped neonatal care. Please log to this table. We can categorize the small for gestational age and fetal gross restriction into these categories. This is the stage, this is the description of each stage, and this is the viability monitoring, and this is the delivery time, okay? Okay, let us start with small for gestational age, which is, in which the expected fetal weight is less than 10th percentile, but more than 3rd percentile, okay? So, we will do monitor viability every two weeks by Doppler and by physical profile. And if this baby expected to be healthy but small, first can be at full term at four to weeks. And, but we don't advise to use prostaglandin for induction of labor because we are afraid from hyperstimulation because there may be there may be placental injury which is hidden. So with the use of prostaglandin hyperstimulation in the trying contraction may occur, so we, we didn't encourage the use of prostaglandin for induction. Okay, so, so if small for gestational age with follow-up, everything is fine, biophysical profile is fine. So we can wait till term and do induction for labor or cesarean 
according to obstetric indication. Otherwise, vaginal delivery. Okay? But if stage one gross restriction, I mean in description, expected fetal weight less than third or less than first percentile, monitor viability every week with Doppler and biophysical profile, and if less than third, the expected fetal weight less than third percentile, we can wait up to 38 weeks. So long as there is no complications during follow-up with Doppler and biophysical profile. Or if the expected fetal weight is less than first, maximum we will deliver at 37 weeks. Okay? Okay. Stage two, fetal growth restriction. There is abnormalities in the umbilical artery and the middle cerebral artery or cerebral placental ratio. We'll monitor the viability twice a week with Doppler and the biophysical profile and the maximum we will deliver at 37 weeks so long as no complications happen or no deterioration happen. So maximum is 37 weeks. Okay? Okay. Stage 3. Zero diastolic and umbilical artery. We need hospitalization. And the daily monitoring with Doppler, CTG, and the biophysical profile. Maximum waiting till 34 weeks and do elective cesarean section. Okay? And you can deliver before if the condition deteriorates. Okay, and the, the patient is hospitalized. Okay, stage four, fetal gross restriction. Umbilical artery with reverse diastolic row or ductus venosus, but still T index, more than 95th versatile, hospitalization and induction of labor. Labor when viable, between 26 and 28 weeks, elective cesarean section is done. Is the best choice. Stage 5, reverse wave ductus venosus or short term variation in CTG less than 3 or decrease the fetal heart rate, hospitalization immediately, and labor when viable between 26 and 28 weeks by elective cesarean section. Of course, you should have the consent of the family, of the mother and the father, about the mode of the delivery, and, the, the and to tell them about the prognosis of this baby, and all possible complications, okay? Because it is very important. This is abbreviation for the previous table. To read it to help you in the, in the previous slide. So, lastly, what is the mode of delivery? Vaginal or cesarean? Vaginal, if no contraindication, this is the rule. But we are aware about labor is stressful. Each contraction reduce oxygenation. As I said before, don't use prostaglandin because of risk of uterine hyperstimulation from hidden placental injury, which may increase the possibility of hyperstimulation of uterine contraction and deteriorate the condition of the fetus. Don't forget to do continuous fetal monitoring by CTG during labor. Avoid prolonged or difficult labor. Amnio infusion, some may advise the use of amnio infusion in case of oligodramnus by installation of normal saline inside the amniotic cavity 
either vaginally after rupture of membrane using the intra-atrium pressure caster introduced through the cervix or through a needle trans-abdominal. The other mode of delivery, the elective lower segment cesarean section, which is increasing nowadays. The indication is prematurity, severe fetal breast restriction, baby, especially the stages three, four, five, abnormal presentation, abnormal non-stress test, unfavorable cervix, and severe oligohydram. How the baby lock with fetal gross restriction, as you see here, the head is an asymmetric gross vibration, the head is proportionally large for the trunk, as you see. Facial appearance looks like an old man, the nails, long nails, scaphoid abdomen, dry wrinkled skin, this is how the baby look. Complication very important and should get our attention because we have two different categories of complications, neonatal one and the long term one. And then don't forget the long term one because it is important one. Each Either the neonatal period or long term one include cardiovascular, respiratory, neurological, and others. Neonatal complication like early hypotension, like hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hypothermia, sepsis, jaundice, polycythemia, increased need for respiration, respiratory distress syndrome, need ventilation, cardiac function issue. Okay, this is neonatal complication, microcephaly, prenatal asphyxia, changes on MRI, white matter and the gray matter changes. Okay, so I have many changes and the EEG changes. Okay, this is a neonatal baby. But what about the long term one? The long term one, this baby, this fetal gross restricted baby, liable in the future for many complications like hypertension, ischemic heart disease, stroke, atherosclerosis, chronic respiratory insufficiency, neurodevelopmental issue, behavioral and the learning difficulties, behavioral problems, cerebral palsy, dementia, mental health issue, failure to thrive, obesity, immune dysfunction, osteoporosis, metabolic syndrome, and renal disease. So, there is long-term complication and neonatal early complication. So, we should take care about this. So, we should give the baby with fetal gross restriction much care to avoid all these complications, either the early one or the long term one. Lastly, some key points and some points for prognosis. In diagnosis, fetal gross restriction, give attention to abdominal circumference. I already mentioned this many times. Early signs of fetal gross restriction in a small or gestational age fetus involve umbilical artery and middle cerebral artery changes. In early fetal gross restriction, what is important is the umbilical artery double because it is the first to be abnormal. While in late fetal gross restriction, what is important is the middle cerebral artery of the baby, double, because it is the first to become abnormal. Okay? So in early, the first to become abnormal is the umbilical artery double. In late fetal gross restriction, the first to be abnormal is the middle cerebral artery, okay, of the fetus. The earlier the fetal gross restriction in pregnancy, the worse is the prognosis. Fetal gross restriction babies experiencing asphyxia at birth have a higher chance of developing neurological problem and childhood 
in childhood and the educational difficulties and the other cognitive and behavioral abnormalities. Late signs of compromise involve ductus venosus. Early diagnosis of fetal grass restriction is very important because it enables the identification of the etiology of the condition and the adequate monitoring of the fetal state, thereby minimizing the risks of premature births and the intrauterine hypoxia. And this is very important. Thank you. I'm Dr. Alam Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University.